Welcome to the Feminist AF Podcast, where we encourage women to be unapologetically themselves, to take up more space in the world, and to embrace being too much. I'm your host, Jenny Manpa. I'm a licensed clinical therapist, women's leadership coach, and published author. I began my social work career working in juvenile justice, victims advocacy, and community mental health, which highlighted for me how many social issues disproportionately affect women. I found myself trying to do everything and do it perfectly, and all that got me was burned out before I even hit 30. I knew something had to change, so I dug deep into figuring out my own value system, and from there, I founded my own private practice called Forward and Heels, which helps women learn to excel at what they do and stand tall so they can light up the world. Each week, you'll hear from women who are kicking ass, lifting other women up, and changing the status quo. As a quick but important legal disclaimer, this podcast is not therapy. This is for entertainment and discussion purposes only. If you are seeking therapy, please seek out a licensed therapist that you enter into a HIPAA-protected agreement with for treatment. Thanks for joining me, and now let's get feminist as fuck. Welcome to the show, everybody. My guest today is an incredible woman. Her name is Barbara Majeski. She is a mom, on-air television personality, a cancer survivor, and a passionate philanthropy advocate. In 2015, she was recognized with a Global Humanitarian Award from Operation Smile after mobilizing hundreds of people to fundraise. She was doing everything right. She was a kick-ass stay-at-home mom. She was checking all the boxes, doing all the right things, and then her life came to a crashing halt. I'm going to let Barbara tell you her story. So, Barbara, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. We're so excited to have you. Your story is incredible. And I would love for you to dive in and tell our audience, how did you get to this point? Yes. Yeah, so in 2015, I felt like I was checking all the boxes, doing all the right things. I have three kids. They at the time were 12, 10 and or yeah, 12, 10 and four, uh, two boys and a girl. And um, I felt like I had married the man of my dreams. I you know, I had a really skewed way of looking at my marriage. You know, I thought, oh, wow, I married up and I was kind of almost groomed to believe that, you know, you're like, oh, lucky you. And wow, you landed the big fish. And um, and so because I always bought into that kind of ridiculous pecking order because there is no pecking order. We're all connected and we're all, you know, we're all aligned. Mm -hmm. um, I really just didn't have a vo I didn't have the right voice to navigate my marriage when it was floundering. And what I just thought that, what does he want? What does he want? Like, what's going to make him happy? How do I, I like, he wants me to be a stay at home mom. I could be a stay at home mom. Oh, he wants me to run the philanthropy. I'm going to not only run a philanthropy, I'm going to like trailblaze a <laughs> philanthro philanthropic mission um, and mobilize, you know, every person I, I know and tap every resource I have. I mean, I really just have that kind of personality of like, like, you know, one gear and it happens to be the sixth gear. So, um, you know, I'm checking all the boxes. What does this guy want? What is like, I can't make him happy. And I don't know why he's not happy. And I need to constantly change me change me if I just get thinner and maybe I'll do this and I'll do that. Well, at the end of the day, no matter how hard I was trying to be this person that I thought that he wanted, my marriage failed and came to a really ugly, heartbreaking kind of boom. <laughs> and that's all I can share right now because I'm still in the middle of a divorce. So yep, fair enough. let's just say that um, <laughs> and wait for the book coming out at some point in my life. But, it, you know, it really just almost I feel it was a very karmic intervention that I discovered that, you know, my marriage was over. Read between the lines, ladies and gentlemen, as I'm saying these things. Um, <laughs> but I think it was a karmic intervention that allowed me to, you know, see what I saw and tell me this is you need to take a a U-turn lady. Anyway, so I'm in the process of like reassessing my marriage and how I'm going to deal with, you know, raising three kids as a single mom. And I got handed a stage three cancer diagnosis. I was 42. Wow. And it was, I was in such disbelief of like, wait a second, my marriage is failing. So I actually cannot have cancer. So you can, <laughs> doctor friend, go review the charts because we're not going to go ahead and have cancer today because my marriage is failing falling apart. Yeah. You're like, my plate is full. No, thank you. Uh, yeah. Return that. <laughs> and I really just, I didn't sign up for a failed marriage. My parents have been together for 40 something. Oh my God, almost 50 years. And I've had the same best friend since I was 12 years old. I really pride myself on loyalty and, you know, I just, it wasn't, I didn't sign up for it. Yeah. 
that, you know, life has a funny way of taking you on some twists and turns. And, you know, I went forward with my cancer treatments. My cancer took front, you know, took center stage. And I had to have surgery and then six months of chemo. And when I was knee deep in chemo, I had this real aha moment. And it was, you know, it was a real like the good and the bad of cancer and these life-changing moments that we all go through. This isn't like indigenous to Barbara Majeski. We all (laughs) go through transformative experiences that really do put us in the fetal position and, uh, you know, really bring us to our knees. And I literally was in the fetal position on a bathroom floor in this story. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Like figuratively and literally physically on a bathroom floor where my best friend had to like pick me up and that's another chapter in a book. (laughs) Anyway, I think we all have these transformative lows and moments that you have this clarity. And for me, when I was really confronted with my own mortality, I had, you know, I what it wasn't cancer that was going to kill me. It was chemo. I really struggled with it. And I thought at one point, because I had to go in for another infusion and I was like, I don't, this body can't, you can't, I don't know why they think it's okay to literally annihilate me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this is where my story ends. I was like, this is where my story ends. How are my kids going to remember me? And how will... You know, what what's my legacy? What did I do if my story ends at 42? And Mm -hmm. I kind of peeled back all these layers and realized, you know, all the things I was proud of and I wanted my kids to know about and mostly what it all hinged upon through this experience of really reflecting on my life, I kept, you know, anytime I wanted to quit, which was all the time, whether it was putting myself through college or starting a business or, you know, launching that philanthropy initiative, whenever I wanted to quit, I thought of my brother, Stephen. I always thought, well, if I quit college, I can't help take care of my brother with special needs. Mm-hmm. And if I can't take care of him, he's going to be institutionalized. Boom, done, finished college. I When I started my business when I was in my early 20s, and it was really hard and it was really crazy. But I knew I had to take a commission-based kind of opportunity-based business because I couldn't just work for $30,000 a year and hope somebody was going to give me a bonus or a raise. I mean, I really just always wanted to keep my brother out of an institution and I knew taking care of him for a lifetime would be very pricey. So I always just, I knew I had to kind of just go on a track that was a little more entrepreneurial and risky and commission-based. So I did and I wanted to quit all the time because it was totally insane because when you work on commission, you either make all or nothing. Like you're either selling (laughs) or you're not selling. And (laughs) So I'm like sitting there like, what am I doing? I was going door to door, door to door, ladies and gentlemen, cold call sales, door to door, (laughs) working on straight commission. Um, And I did. I wanted to quit. And I thought, well, if I quit, I can't take care of you. Okay, keep going, Babs. Figure it out. Figure Mm -hmm. it out. How did that person make money? How did that person make money? How did they, uh, you know, achieve personal wealth? And I really just had this single minded you know, goal focus of like, I have to do well financially to take care of Steven. And it always kept me in a very humbled learning position. And then when I launched the philanthropy initiative for Operation Smile, it really was on the understanding that, you know, these are all Stevens. These are the Stevens of the world. And if I don't speak for them, who the hell else is going to do it? And I've got a big mouth and I've got a great network of, you know, um, colleagues that I had, you know, just I just knew and I had a resource that I that had never been tapped for philanthropy and I tapped it and it really, it blew up. It was really, really quite impressive. And um, I was really fortunate that everybody just really bought into my vision of like, if we collaboratively focus on one humanitarian mission, you know, we can raise hundreds of thousands of dollars and people believed in me. So as I'm going through this transformative, like, I want my kids to know I put myself through college and I started a business and I took care of Stephen and I t- launched this philanthropy initiative. I thought, oh, well, God, thank God I was taking care of Stephen this whole time. <laughs> and it was, oh, this moment of like true, like humility of like, oh my God, I, I was never taking care of Stephen it was always Stephen was taking care of me. Wow. He gave me my greatest purpose. I'm like, oh my God, I would have quit everything. I would have quit. I would have finished nothing. But because I had Stephen, I had this purpose. And when you're gifted the gift of purpose, there's no there's no price tag on that. But the reason I share this more than anything, and then I'll get, get to what I want to share is that we all have been gifted purpose. We all have great purpose. And it's just disguised sometimes in some of the most 
darkest, difficult, challenging circumstances. And when you can use your circumstances, your experience, your no, like your like that tangible understanding of experience and humanity and you use it in a level of service and purpose, that's where we're all aligned in in humanity. And we all have it. We just don't always have the capacity to see it. And I think in that moment when I was really going through what are people going to remember me me about and I realized I had been given such a great gift and I never even acknowledged it. I said to the universe, I said, all right, universe, give me one more shot. Give me one. Get me out of this chemo. Get me out of this cancer and I will continue to live out my purpose. I will not stop until I take my last breath. And that's kind of where you're meeting me today. You know, when I got to the other side of cancer, I was like, all right, universe, I owe you one. Thanks. Now <laughs> let's get in gear. And I really thought, well, you know what? I I want to share my story and my love of giving back and my, you know, I, of course, my passion is always going to go to children and adults with special needs like my brother. But I realized like I needed I needed a big, bigger microphone. I needed a bigger platform. I needed more eyeballs. I needed people. I needed like I was like, I need to just build out my my me, my, you know, everyone's talking about brands. And I'm like, I guess I just need to build. I got to get got to get out there. I got a story to share and I have to help others. And that's what we're here with. That's what we're here in in this world to do is we're here to live in service that's it. My book would be one line if it was like, why are we here? <laughs> we are here to live in service. Goodbye. Thank you. End of story. Oprah Winfrey had told me that actually years ago. And that's a whole nother story. We can get to that later because we only have so much time. But <laughs> yes. Yeah, so uh, that's what launched me into television. And I think like, again, I don't mean to be so like universal and, you know, new agey, but I don't really know what else to say. I was like, all right, let's get to it. I would love to be on TV. I always wanted to be on TV and I just dodged death. And I realized that we all have, we can only control that dash between our two numbers, 1973 dash till who knows when. And I got to make this dash really colorful and amazing. And I want television on that, on that lifeline like that. I was like, I want to be on TV and actually going through cancer and having my, uh, you know, my marriage fall apart. I really started to look at my own internal dialogue of, you know, I'm not worthy and only pretty people are on TV and I'm not this enough and I'm not that enough. And I and I had enough of that voice. Mm -hmm. I was like, all right, you know what? That voice is has and is going to end you. And we are done with that. And I really took stock of that conversation and that dialogue. And I decided to really confront it of like, who, what, I don't know, voice, who you think you are to tell me I'm not pretty enough and I'm not smart enough and I'm not tall enough and I'm not thin enough and I'm not, I'm too old. Like, who are you, voice, to come into my <laughs> my realm and to, no, we're done with you. You've served your I don't know if you've served your purpose, but you've caused enough damage Mm -hmm. and I was doing damage control. I'm like, I, I am worthy and we are all worthy. Mm -hmm. You want to do something. And it was really just like really looking at that voice, that dialogue, that stupid tape in my head of I'm not, I'm not enough, you know? And it was, it was honestly the crash and burn of my marriage of like, uh, you know what, Barbara, it's enough. It's an, you know, it's enough of that voice. It did you no good at this point. It didn't save your marriage. It didn't keep him interested. And it was stupid. It's a stupid comment. I was like, forget this. So I I decided I was going to go hire a media trainer. And I found this woman on Instagram. And how awkward is that? Because I'm 47. I'm not like, you know, I listen, I was I'm pre cell phone and Internet. Like, you know, this is a new world. And I was like, how do you call somebody and say, hey, I trolled you on the <laughs> Facebooks and the uh, Instas. Um, finally, after writing her name down 7,000 times, I just picked up the phone. I was like, and I called her. And anyway, she Googled me. And when she saw my humanitarian work, she was like, oh, wait a second. You've done public speaking. You would be great on television. I'm like, oh, okay, great. So I met her long story short. My first booking was on the Today Show. Hello. No big deal. No big, no biggie. (laughs) No biggie. I didn't eat for like a month. I couldn't believe I got booked on the Today Show. And it was really just a gift. It's so funny because, and gosh, I can talk. I mean, you want to interview me? I don't know. Uh, this is, <laughs> so what's interesting, I read the book, The Secret. Did you ever read that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
I read that 150 years ago when it first came out and yeah. everybody was talking about it. And I wrote in that book, I want to be on the Today Show. Mm-hmm. And you know, in that book, you're like, you manifest your own destiny. Mm-hmm. So write it down if you want. I remember writing it down and be like, all right, Babs, do the Today Show. Here you go. But you told me because I read the book and I saw them. You know, I think I actually cheated and watched like the movie or something. <laughs> there wasn't a movie, but there was like some sort of something. Yeah, yeah, on yeah. TV. It was like a, I don't want to say documentary, yeah. but something about it. Yeah. There was something that's kind of yeah. like I, I skipped and went to the Cliff Notes. So yeah. anyway, um, <laughs> Yeah, that's where you're meeting me today. You know, I'm I'm really throwing it all out there. I'm doing podcasts. I'm going on television. I'm, I I I whatever anybody asks. Yeah, I, they ask me to carve pumpkins. I'll carve. What do you want? <laughs> what do you need me to do? And I will do it. And the best was when they call me like, "Can you carve pumpkins?" And I'm like, "I love. Yes. I, I, I will never, carve the best pumpkin I've you've ever, ever seen." Because <laughs> there's nothing you can't Google. I mean, like, yeah, I can figure things out. Like, that's a great book, Marie Florio. She, it's called Everything is Figure Outable or something. I forget. She mm-hmm. just, I love her conversations of like, yeah, just her mother taught her it's everything's figure outable. So, yeah, that's my story and where you find me today. That's incredible. And, you know, I think a lot of people roll their eyes at this idea of like manifest your destiny, but there is actually some research behind what really happens when you set an intention. It's not just woo woo, put it out into the universe. You change your own unconscious behaviors by setting a goal for yourself. And you decided to silence the, I call them the mean girls in your head. They know exactly which buttons to push and they know exactly where your deepest, darkest fears are. to shut up. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Right. And when you write down Mm -hmm. that this is what you're going to do, your brain starts to seek out things that will fulfill that goal. Our brains yes. are really incredible things. They're also, you know, very complicated when they send us into anxiety spirals we can't control, but they work yes. really well for us sometimes. <laughs> Agreed. And I the, I love these kind of conversations because it does help us to rewrite the script in our head because we do control, we can control our thoughts, which ultimately control our emotions and our actions, our behaviors, and ultimately our destiny. And I really did have to take a huge look at what was going on between the ears. Because I guess when you're confronted with your own mortality with a diagnosis of cancer, you're like, wait a second, I really want to go great. Like, I want to go great this life. Yeah. I It's a gift. I took things for granted, you know, and, and now I want to kind of, I don't kind of want to go for it. I want to go for it. And I have these moments right now. And I was just um, driving in. I'm down at the Jersey Shore right now. And I was driving over the bridge and I had this moment of real clarity and gratitude. And it was, thank God I'm not in an infusion suite today. As much as like, I think, you know, I'm going through this divorce and all this crazy, crazy, hard, hard life stuff. I am like trying to focus in on gratitude, but it was so nice to be like, remember, Barbara, when you were in an infusion suite and your life was hijacked and you couldn't go ski and you couldn't be with your kids and you couldn't, you couldn't do anything. Well, today you're not in an infusion suite. Today you get to live your best life and mm-hmm. you're not tethered to a IV and somebody is today. Somebody yeah. is. And I have to live for for that, like that. Like I need to be, we all need to be reminded. Yes, we, our internal dialogue needs to sometimes be rescripted because we're spiraling into spaces that are unhealthy, unserving, and really we're better than that. So, yeah. you know, listen, I, I got some bitches in this head, man. They are <laughs> s- sassy and... Yep. And they're really experts at what they do. They know exactly Amazing. what to say. Oh, God, dig deep, <laughs> sister, right? There, I'm like, oh my God. You're like, I didn't even know I hated that about myself. I didn't even know. <laughs> and then here we are. And it's so... And then you're like, but having these moments of like, stop. All right. Like, these are just thoughts. Let's think of something. Let's go. Let's, yeah. let's redirect because life is life is short it's cliche but we get one one shot at it and we need to fulfill our own happiness and we're responsible for that and you know i love your podcast it's like just find your lane find that's what you're saying is like yeah. find your lane live out your truth be you don't try to you know don't conform nobody pfft. Don't be you. <laughs> yeah. Go on the Today Show for just yeah. shits and giggles. I mean, who does that? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm writing down the Today Show right now on my like vision yes, board. <laughs> good. Write it all down. Like, I, love I am it. gonna. Uh, my vision board is. I'm gonna. Uh, my next. I'm getting married again. I don't know who the lucky bastard is, but he's <laughs> out there, and I really just think I'm gonna have this amazing second marriage to an amazing man, and really have this really like bountiful, plenty like just this in really great life. I, I, I'm, 
I'm worthy of it. I know yeah. I, I am. And that's like on my vision board of like this, I'm going to manifest this amazing man. I don't know where yeah. you are. Are you listening to me? Like come <laughs> to my I mean, screen. listen, <laughs> if a man is listening to a podcast called Feminist AF, he is definitely going to find you because he's like, yes, <laughs> this woman is a powerhouse. I'm coming for her. That's my girl. <laughs> you found me. <laughs> you know, and I love how you say this about your vision board because we are so adept at the worst case scenario, right? We can spiral into, yeah. okay, well, I'm going to be late for this interview and then I'm going to miss it and then I'm not going to get the job and then I'm going to be homeless and then I'm going to go on, you know, public yeah. assistance and, and we spiral and we forget that if we have the ability to be that creative with the worst case scenario, we can be that creative with the best possible outcomes and we can actually make those happen. 100%. And we need to go in that those tracks more, especially when we're raising kids and we're influencing other people. I I think when, you know, the power of the way that you think influences other people. And I always say courage is contagious. Like, mm. and, you know, hang out with people that, you know, you can, it's like a candle. It, it's, it's a candle. It's not going to burn less because you borrow the flame. It's actually, we're going to all burn brighter by sharing courage and, you know, try to, try to catch some of it. it yes. You know, and that's why I share, my journey on Instagram and wherever. I mean, I'm on like, uh, what am I on? TikTok now. I'm on TikTok, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. No. <laughs> I am. I'm on TikTok, but I mean, everyone's got to follow me because on my first video, I got 3 million views. Just saying, what? humble brag. Three mil- uh-huh. Yeah, it was a very, it's a funny story. Only be, I'll be short. My daughter does TikTok. She's eight. She does them all day long. And she did this voiceover thing. And I was like, that's so cool. How do you do that? And I was like, I think I want to do it with my, one of my crafts that I do for television. So I did it. And I was like, oh, Melena, will you post this on your TikTok? And she's like, oh, mom, that's so stupid. I'm not doing that. I was like, she goes, get your own. I was like, okay, I guess I'll get my own TikTok. So I I get my own TikTok and it goes viral. <laughs> my daughter was like, what just happened? Oh, so I have 22,000 followers on TikTok and I, I, I don't know what I don't know what to do next. <laughs> what What is your TikTok handle? <laughs> Barbara Majeski. Okay, easy don't, enough. Listen, I don't mean to, uh, <laughs> listen, you're going to be like, um, Barbara, you have two videos. I'm like, yeah, I know. I don't know what, I don't know what to do listen, next. Listen, it's quality over quantity, okay? That's, I know. I I really, I don't want to disappoint my new fan base. No. <laughs> I no. don't know what to do. I'm not dancing on TikTok. I'm definitely going to do some of my crafts and stuff like that. My pumpkin carving when it's time. Um, It just takes a lot of work. So that's, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I that's hope I'm, incredible. I hope I'm staying on on my on point here. Oh my god, there's literally audience. no lane in this conversation. Okay. It's All like right. tell me everything. Um, but actually, I do want to ask: Did you, when you were diagnosed, so you said it's colon cancer? So, yep. w- were you having a standard colonoscopy, or were there some symptoms for people who are like, well, how would I know? Yeah, so I have a colon cancer runs in my family, and uh, my dad actually was diagnosed much later in, in his seventies, and he was actually stage zero, and I was a stage three at forty two, wow. and I. I will tell you what my theory is. It's very simple. I think I had a predisposition for colon cancer, and I think I fed the predisposition cancer food. I really think I the diet crap, all the artificial crap, the any you it, Splenda, sweet and low. It went in everything because I was always very you know I, I always had a weight problem. Like I did, I just always struggled a lot with my weight. I have it under control now, but I really just so everything was diet snack wells and and I just think I fit. My dad would never touch diet. He goes, if I'm gonna have ice cream, I'm having ice cream. If mm. I'm going to have butter, it's butter. If I'm gonna have a soda, it's soda because it's sugar. And he's like, you can digest that. It, that was his theory, mm. and I think he was right. So, wow. um, I was constantly bloated. I felt like I walked around like a pot belly pig. My energy was really starting to wane. I just couldn't process food. It just, I, it was a history. And then there just was, I just, the distension in my body was Mm -hmm. really uncomfortable. And yeah, I got a screening at 42. Uh, I should have had it at 40, but And now the baseline is 45. So anybody who's 45, you should be scheduling your colonoscopy. And it's a great cleanse. You want to lose five to seven pounds in an afternoon. There you go. Whatever. (laughs) Okay, I've had one. They are so miserable. Miserable. Uh, Only the prep. The prep will end you. It will end you. It could end your marriage too. So just go get a hotel (laughs) Yeah, you better be alone. (laughs) Be alone. Get yourself a room. But, you know, when it's all said, you wake up the next day, like, and, you know, after they do it, you're like, I am skinny pants. I mean, get your 
get the, have a pool party right then and there. <laughs> you so, feel yeah. truly like like Lighter. your fresh start, like Cle- empty. You're truly cleansed. Yeah. It's unlike any cleanse you can buy on yeah. a blueprint <laughs> website, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So actually, this this is really interesting because, you know, obviously this podcast is called Feminist AF. And, you know, I'd love to know what, what Feminist AF means to you. And I'm curious, you know, talking about the diet culture, which I think was really what you're talking about. Snackwells and the fake stuff was like yeah. so prevalent in the 90s too and like the early 2000s of like fake everything. And I do think we've moved more towards, you know, eat food that comes from the ground, you know, try yeah. not to, to eat food I that we've done much better. Yeah, yeah, has been made in a lab. Um, and I'd also love to know, you know, in terms of going from starting a business and working on commission to being a stay-at-home mom, a lot of this debate is... You know, there are feminists who say, you know, well, we fought for the right for you to go to work. And so you're taking us backwards by being a stay at home mom. And there are others who say, no, you fought for my right to choose. And I choose to stay here and raise these children and and inspire the next Mm -hmm. generation. Like, how did you feel about going from working to being at home and within that sort of lens of feminism? You know, it's uh, that's a really great question because I'm really proud and I'm really glad and grateful that I chose to be a stay-at-home mom. It's nothing I thought I would do. I think it was really what my uh, my husband wanted me to do at the time, and I really wanted to please him, and I that was a box I was checking of being a good wife. Whatever. We're going to have to go to therapy to figure out that. <laughs> but, you know, I think it is such a disservice to not honor stay-at-home moms. And I can't begin to tell you, it plays over and over again. It is a systemic problem that it's a bias and it is a real disservice because stay-at-home moms and being able to be there for your kids when they're very young, um, I think is the greatest gift that you can give them. And I think I gave them, I just really was incredibly involved. And I, like, listen, I'm not going to lie. I didn't always enjoy it. I didn't find it very fulfilling. I felt um, at times the judgy eyes coming from the working moms Mm -hmm. and they had a certain, I felt, an arrogance of like, oh, (laughs) You know, oh, well, we work, you know, mm-hmm. oh, what do you do? Mm-hmm. All Must be day? nice to be at home all day. Oh, <laughs> you know, and what do I, th- th- this one, what do you do all day? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I do all the things you don't have time to do, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. but that's just my ego <laughs> responding instead of being like, you know, it's not a teachable moment because everyone's egos are, you know, attacking each other as opposed to really aligning in a more human experience, you know, and I just would wish that more women would be women, men, society. I think we have a long way to go to go back to respecting stay at home moms. And so we feel good about the decisions that we made. And I I, like I love that I did that. And I'm truly so grateful um, for it. And now I'm back in, you know, working and trying to rebuild myself you know, I think you can have it all, but you just sometimes you can't have it all at once. And mm-hmm. I think some people are scared to take their foot off the career gas pedal because they think they're going to be obsolete and forgotten. And it's such a like you're just caught in this conundrum that men are not. And it's just it is what it is. I'm not like I'm not going to sit there and fight fights. And it is what it is. Um, but you can have it all. You just can't have it all at once. Mm-hmm. And it is OK to take your foot off any gas pedal. It is OK to shift gear and redirect your energy. But it is all about what is going to make you happy and make your soul sing. I think I too much of my self-worth was weighted on how other people valued me. Oh, she's, oh my God, they think I'm lazy. I'm a stay at home. Oh my God, they think that I'm dumb. They think I'm uneducated. You know, all these, it's none of their, it's none of what, what's the quote? It's none of my business what people think about me. And <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I'm like, I like that. I'm like, oh, yeah. you're right. Because, you know, what mattered was that my kids were, the, I was with my kids. And, yeah. you know, um, there's this great book my friend is reading. And this morning, she just told me this great tidbit from it that I'll share. And it's like the seven lessons of le- le- lessons you learn in life from the from the dying, I, I'm mm. probably getting the title wrong, but mm-hmm. the essence of it, she goes, at the end of, this is a, written by a woman who's done hospice care. And what I want to share is that it all comes down to relationships. When it's all said and done, and you're at the end of the line, it all comes down to relationships. It's not how big your house was, what kind of car you drove, and you know what this, that, and the other things. It is all about the relationships in your life. And as you kind of go from your body to your spirit in that you tr- transitional time, you know, all of a sudden it's like it's these people, it's the people, and you know, just hearing that also kind of 
you know, as we're going into this conversation of like, it is about the relationships. It's not just your working career relationships, which are super important and are super rewarding and incredibly like really enriches our soul and helps us grow and learn. But it's also the personal relationships within our lives. And sometimes we need to focus in on them by being a parent or being a caretaker or, you know, a sibling or, you know, I don't know. I think it just all, we just all have to be okay with saying, I've got to shift gears I'm not putting it full throttle in this space or that space. Like I shifted gears. I'm no longer a, you know, a stay-at-home mom. I'm also no longer married and I'm no longer, <laughs> you know, I'm sharing a whole lot of gears I've shifted over here. Uh, but that's what I want to share. It's like, you know, for me saying being a feminist is being comfortable in your own skin and charting your own course and not allowing, you know, these pigeonhole boxes to define how we should be living because they're all garbage. They're all mystical and they're all man-made. They yeah. are literally all yeah. bullshit, man-made, yeah. bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. You are here to live out your life and live in service and at a, it's different for everyone. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that's me being a feminist, being a stay-at-home mom. Boom. <laughs> no, Back I love it. Work. I love it. And mm-hmm. the thing is, you know, systemically and societally, society, I don't think that's a word. Yeah. Um, we, Works for me. Yeah. <laughs> we, mm-hmm. um, you know, I've spent a lot of time in my career as a social worker studying um, violence and women and victimization and particularly intimate partner violence. And one of the biggest predictors and indicators of any sort of later in life disorder, usually that leads to violence, is a lack of connection in childhood. And there are children who grow up in abusive alcoholic households, but who have an adult in their lives who care about them. Yes. You almost never hear about someone who commits violence, whose home life as a child was loving and supportive. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's one case in a trillion. And that's like a, a, con- a conflation of circumstances and chemical, you know, in the brain, right, whatever. But right, it's almost right. never the case. Mm-hmm. Conversely, 100% of convicted um, sexual abusers, pedophiles, have had have been sexually abused as children. So that wow. is just a one-to-one 100%. correlation. 100%. Wow. wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, that doesn't go the other way, right? Not all children who were sexually abused grow up to be abusers. But right, all right, adult right, abusers right. were abused as children. Mm-hmm. So when we, you know, denigrate stay-at-home moms or caregiving, we really are saying that we don't care about creating the next generation of humans. And we see mass shootings every day. And yeah. a lot of that is stems back to people saying, usually men, saying, like, they have this this unchecked anger and they've usually funneled it towards women who reject them because they didn't have any of these positive outlets in childhood, these coping skills, these ways to express any of their feelings. They didn't have an adult who taught them what does it mean to have feelings that you don't always act on, right? Right. So many people who grow up to commit crimes just go from impulsive feeling to impulsive action because they haven't learned the space in between. And caregiving is the most important thing that we do to create the next generation of humans. And we just disrespect it so much in this country by setting up systems where you have to choose. We do. We we really don't hold it with a high regard. And I think we need as a culture and as a society need to get back to that of how you take care of the most vulnerable members of society, whether that is somebody who's aging, disabled or a child really is how society should be judged and it should be held in higher regard and higher respect. And I think it just it's having these kind of conversations of this is life is, you know, life is many chapters and it's okay to change, you know, the script is going to change and morph. And, you know, I'm proud of my caregiving, my, you know, my real focus as a caregiver. I'm very tight with my kids now. And I taught them how to ride bikes and ski. And I like, I'm I'm really, really, really lucky. And I'm really lucky that I didn't allow those voices, the egos to you to get under my skin too much. I mean, mm-hmm. they got a little bit under my skin. But, <laughs> of course, you know, <laughs> I just want people to know that that wasn't very nice when they said that to me. Okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And so circling back to, to what you talked about earlier about living with purpose and finding mm-hmm. your purpose, you have created a lifestyle initiative, a global lifestyle initiative called the Cur- You're the Curator of the Good Life. Tell us about mm-hmm. this. So, you know, I'm just trying to pull this all together. You know, I love finding cool and fabulous things. I love companies that align with like a social give back. 
like whether it's these huge chocolates that I love and they're doing crackers. They're just so aligned with giving back. There's uh, this popcorn for the people, which is they employ adults with autism. There's so many great companies that are now aligning with a higher social cause. I love bringing that to people's attention and featuring that on television. I think living life with adventure, you know, going out, living outside your comfort zone and, you know, pushing people to choose to be a little uncomfortable. Like right now I'm going swimming in the open water in the bay in Stone Harbor, New Jersey. And it's funny, my my friend was like, do you want to swim with us? I'm like, I haven't swam in years, but I know how to swim because I swam in high school. Mm-hmm. Like, I was like, well, I swam in high school. I know how to breathe. I guess mm-hmm. I can do it. But I put myself in a situation constantly to be uncomfortable. So as this like curator, the good life, like my thing is like really helping other people to get out of their own way to make conscious decisions when they purchase to really support companies like the popcorn for the people and huge chocolates and so many other brands that are really looking for ways to be socially conscious, not just environmentally conscious, but socially conscious. And I'm, um, you know, share living with purpose, so share my story and saying, you know, just like I had said in this, you know, conversation over and over again, we all have great purpose. And it just sometimes it's even in the smallest thing. It's how we treat each other and look people in their the eye and thank them and regard their experience, you know, whether they're bagging your groceries. And sometimes we just over promote what purpose is. You know what? It's sometimes on a day to day basis. It is your purpose is to make uh, to see the light in other people's mm-hmm. uh, other people, other people's. I mean, what am I? have lost my English language. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's like that, you know, namaste, my light shine, you know, the light in me that shines in you like that respect of mm-hmm. like show somebody with that icon to thank you. Like, thank you for doing my nails or my hair or Mm -hmm. thank you for being the crossing guard and really like living with that humanity, uh, that purpose. So that's what, you know, that's kind of my calling right now. I think just living, you know, curating, sharing, I say fine test, share all of it, you know, because I think so many people are in their own, they need to get out of their own way. People need to get out of their own way. You are the only one stopping you from living your best life, living, you know, living out your purpose, your passion, your everything, you know, figure it out, get out of your own way and watch, you know, follow me. That's what my, why I share it on social media. I'm like, watch me. I'm going to go ahead and make an ass out of myself today <laughs> on some sort of program. So uh, you know, we'll go, you know, go from there. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and for whatever reason, you what you just made me think of was when you park your car in a parking lot and then you go into the store and you come back out and someone has parked so close that you can't get in. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, well, what do I do? There's mm-hmm. always a way, right? Maybe you have to pop the trunk. Maybe you have to climb in through the skylight. Maybe you have to go to the right. passenger side and get in mm-hmm. that way. But there's a way. You don't just stand there in the parking lot until the sun goes down in the hopes mm-hmm. that someone will come move their car. And I think that there are a lot of people who would just stand there and wait. And those are the people who are in their own way, but saying it's someone else when they just haven't tried to think of alternatives. Like you said, like, you know, just, just Google it, just uh, you figure it out, you know, just look it up. Something can happen. It doesn't have to be exactly how you thought it was going to be, but there is so much that's within our control back to the like manifesting and the thinking about how you make, make and set those goals and then pursue them. There is so much more to be done that we can do that we do have control over, but we spend more time worrying about the things we don't have control over. Right. 100%. And sometimes it's just doing the next right thing. You know, Mm -hmm. sometimes we over just put one foot in front of the other. I think it's actually out of the movie Frozen where they're like, (laughs) just do the next right thing. And I'm like, oh, my God, I like that because it's like just put one foot in front of the other. Mm -hmm. Stop looking at the whole mountain. Look at your feet. Move them forward and you will figure it out. You will, you know, just take the next, make the next move. So yes, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, incredible. Barbara, you are a powerhouse, a force to be reckoned with. I feel so alive and and zealous right now. I'm going to go out and take on the world. Where can people find you besides TikTok? (laughs) (laughs) Well, please follow me on TikTok because the world and myself are waiting for the next great video. Um, Just, it's all Barbara Majeski. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook. I am really not that creative with that. <laughs> but but my podcast is called Bearing It All, which is really just peeling back the layers of the highlight reel and sharing the, the grit behind the glam. Amazing. We're going to link to everything in the show notes so nobody has to write this down. Barbara, thank you so much for being here. This was incredible. Well, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you took something away from this conversation and don't forget to stay feminist as fuck by being unapologetically yourself, taking up more space in the world and embracing being too much. 
If you like what you heard today, please rate, review, subscribe, and tell your friends. 